that one comment, John, if you, uh, what we, last time, uh, the major comment and the challenge was, actually the major comments given uh, from different uh, angles, the report needs to include more epidemiological also reports. It has to show some epidemiological indications. Can you really uh, support on this to give us some highlight to include epidemiological aspects of the report? Uh, uh, in this moment, I won't have a lot of comments. Sometimes when people ask for epidemiology comments, there are two kinds. There are things that are realistic with existing data and data sources, mm -hmm. and the things that are not realistic, maybe not in the short term, but perhaps in the longer term. Of course, people mm -hmm. would love to have things like incidents. What is the incidence of yeah. MRSA? And the problem with things like incidents is uh, the problems with the numerator and with the denominator. In the numerator, you only have, you know, if people want to know the incidence of positive blood cultures, the problem is in the numerator, uh, 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 let me take that back. If you want to know the incidence of bacteremia, mm. you need two things. You need a patient with bacteremia and a positive blood culture. But if you don't take the blood culture, the right. patient still has bacteremia, but you don't have any evidence of that. So in a lot of low research countries, it's trouble to come up with the correct case count because of undersampling. People yeah. do not have blood cultures. Uh, you know, most things are treated empirically. The problems in the numerator are coming up with a meaningful case count of disease. You can come up with a case count with culture results, but the culture results is simply a subset of everybody who has the disease. So there are problems with the numerator. There are also problems with the denominator. You know, what population is served by my laboratory? That's not an easy question. I'm in the city of Boston, the metropolitan Boston area has over 2 million people, but we have about 20 hospitals, and so they all overlap. I can tell you the population of Boston, but I can't tell you the population served by my hospital. And also we have to keep in mind, my hospital serves the local community of Boston, but my hospital also serves Massachusetts for some things, and the six surrounding states of New England. So we provide primary care to local communities, but we provide secondary and tertiary care to a much larger area. So it doesn't mean we don't do this, but we do need to keep in mind that there are significant challenges at coming up with meaningful numbers. The risk, mm. if you, the risk is if you simply publish the numbers, you end up usually underestimating the disease because we are not taking cultures to a very large degree. You, you end up underestimating the disease incidence but you often overestimate the resistance proportion because when we do take cultures, it is often the sickest people, the treatment failures, the ICU patients, uh, patients with complicated medical histories. So, uh, you know, in often what you may see is that in a, in a biased data set, when you're only looking at treatment failures, uh, you might find a data set that thinks that in this database, in this non-representative database, maybe 40% of the isolates are resistant to a particular antibiotic. But if you really had a true unbiased sample, it might only be 10% resistance. So these ideas of incidents are extremely valuable. But with routine data, you have to be very careful with a lot of caveats and a lot of understanding of the biases. Otherwise, we underestimate the disease, we overestimate the resistance, we may recommend imipenem when it's not really needed. You know, if we are overestimating resistance to appropriate drugs, we may switch to second line drugs because of these biases. Mm -hmm. One of the things we're doing in Vietnam is we are trying to do some simple things. We are doing things like per bed size, per, per hospital bed size. This hospital has maybe 100, this hospital has maybe 100 beds. This other hospital has maybe 100 beds. The first hospital takes maybe 50 blood cultures in a month, and the second hospital maybe only takes 10 blood cultures in a month. Um, so this can be very valuable to look at culturing practices. Hospital one maybe does a very good job of taking blood cultures. Maybe they have the resources, the trust, the materials, the clinical training to take blood cultures. Hospital number two might have exactly the same disease epidemiology, but they are not taking a lot of blood cultures. 
So this is one element of epidemiology with meaningful denominators to look at culturing rates, try to use to estimate incidence rates. One nice thing that they do have in the Vietnam hospitals are um, two variables that the CDC uses a lot. One is number of admissions per year. For example, for example in this hospital last year, we had 10,000 admissions. And then you can do an incidence of, for example, MRSA bacteremia per admission. If they have 10,000 admissions with 100 MRSA, you can calculate an incidence based on the admission rates. In Vietnam, the hospitals also have what we call um, patient days. Patient days, if you have one person staying in the hospital for 30 days, that is 30 patient days. You know, the patient slept in this bed for 30 days. Or in, that's one patient stays in a bed for 30 days. That is 30 patient days. Alternatively, you may have 30 different people and they each stay one night in the hospital. That is also 30 patient days. Um, or if you had 25 people and on average they each stayed for two days, that is also uh, 50 um, patient days, if I said that right. Uh, yeah, 25 people, two days each person, that's 50 days. Um, so it just averages out over the course of the year that we had patients occupying beds for like, you know, four or 500 nights. So this is another incidence measure. You can say, for example, MRSA per patient day of hospitalization. This is very useful for hospital infections and hospital incidents. So in the hospital incidence measures and epidemiology, it's some degree easier because you do know how many patients were hospitalized. You do know, if you have access to the data, how long they stayed. So you, it's easier to come up with incidence measures in a hospital setting because you present your results in terms of hospital days and hospital visits. In the community setting, it's problematic, as I said, because I don't know how large the, the, the what is the population of Addis Ababa served by facility one, by facility two. But it's useful to think about epidemiology of hospital infections and the incidence and the epidemiology of community infections in a different way because the denominators are different, the biases are different. So that's some comments I have on that. And it is useful as I said in Vietnam that they do have the patient, the hospital number of beds, the hospital days of admission, uh, the hospital number of admissions, and the hospital patient days. So those are some comments. But if you send me the document and we compare with some other documents, um, we could look at those as well. Um, another useful thing when you're looking at epidemiology is to try to distinguish between hospital infections and community infections. And this is not easy. There are two potential ways you can try to distinguish between hospital infections and community infections. And the US CDC has a national program called NHSN, the National Healthcare Safety Network. And they offer two different definitions for reporting to the CDC of hospital infections. The first approach is called clinical reporting. And the second approach is called laboratory reporting. The clinical reporting tries to come up with the truth. And they take every patient and they evaluate the patient. Is this blood culture from this patient, from a hospital infection or a, or a community infection? And they look at the patient's history and the patient's risk factors. They may interview the patient. They may try to find out where was the patient was the patient in a nursing home? Did the patient come from another hospital? Did the patient have surgery three weeks ago? So this clinical reporting tries to answer the question, did this patient I am looking at now have a hospital infection or a community infection? The problem with this clinical approach, the two problems with this clinical approach, is it takes a lot of time and effort and information that's not easily available. If you want to do this for everybody, every bl positive blood culture in the hospital, you need to look at the medical records for every patient with a positive blood culture to see and spend maybe half an hour or an hour on the patient's history and say, I see that this patient was hospitalized last week. 
I see that this patient had a surgery three weeks ago. I see that this patient was in a nursing home. I see that this patient was simply at home and they came in with pneumonia. So you can do that to and say this is a true hospital infection or a true community infection. One problem with that, as I said, is it's a lot of work to do this correctly. And the second problem with that approach is that different people will still come up with different answers. There are certain people where it's easy to say this was a community infection. There are other people, it's easy to say this is a hospital infection. You know, they had a hip surgery and then they had a they had hip surgery with MRSA infection, and then two days later they had a positive blood culture. So there are many cases where it's easy. This is hospital infection, this is community infection. But there are a lot of patients in the middle where it really is not clear. Patient was exposed to the hospital, but they did not have high risk, high risk exposure. Uh, by the way, if someone could turn off their, if someone could turn on their mute, there, I hear some noise in the background. Thank you. So, so two problems with the clinical approach to determining hospital infections is one, it's a lot of work, and you need the patient's medical record in detail. Second problem is that even two different people may come up with a different answer. They'll say yes, this one is, this one is, this one I'm not sure. Uh, I'll say yeah, yes it is, and the next person may say no, it isn't. So that's a problem with the clinical approach. The other approach is a purely a data-driven approach. It's not always correct, but it is simple to apply if you have the relevant details, and it is consistent. So every hospital in the United States, around the world, if they apply a consistent definition, it might not tell you the truth for every person, but on average, it will be approximately true. It's much easier to do, and it's also easier to standardize. If you have new staff, you don't have to get, they don't have to be experts in reviewing charts. So I'll now explain to you the lab, it's called the laboratory identified event. It's the laboratory approach to saying if this was possibly a hospital infection. It's what we call a proxy definition. Um, uh, it's what we call a surrogate definition. So the, sur the proxy definitions on average are usually right, but there will be exceptions to this. So what do I mean by this? So the, the simple proxy definition is if you have a patient with an outpatient sample, we are going to call that an outpatient infection. It's easy to do. The patient came to the emergency room. The patient went to the private doctor. The doctor, the patient went to a local host, uh, clinical outpatient laboratory. The fact that they went to an outpatient location, in this simple approach, we're going to simply say it's a, it's a community infection. That's very easy to do but it's not always going to be correct. If the patient was in the hospital for two months and then went home, and then a week later goes to their private doctor out in the community, that could easily be a hospital infection after the patient went home. Patient has a hip surgery, they go home, and then they have an infection while they're at home that is still considered a healthcare associated infection. So this simplified definition of outpatient isolates or outpatient infections is very simple to do, but it will not always be correct. Obviously, some just because you're in the outpatient setting, it's probably an outpatient infection, but it might not be. In the other direction, if you have uh, if you have somebody in the hospital, and they have a positive blood culture with MRSA, is that a hospital infection or a community infection? The simple thing to say, well, the patient was in the hospital, let's call it a hospital infection. But that itself is, there are a lot of, ex there are a lot of cases will not be true, depending on the day of hospitalization. If the patient goes to, their, to the emergency room, they're very sick, they have a high fever, they, they go immediately to the intensive care unit. Once they're in the intensive care unit, the doctor takes a blood culture. If that blood culture is on hospital day one or hospital day two, the patient probably brought the bacteria in from the community. So this is an example of a community infection requiring hospitalization. So just to repeat myself, if you have a, if you have a positive blood culture in a hospital sample, if that hospital sample was taken on hospital day one and two, it's probably a community infection. If the sample was taken on hospital days three, four, and five, it might be a community infection, and they took a while for them to diagnose it, but we're just going to call it a hospital infection. So this is now I'm going to make a recommendation for you in the future in Ethiopia. 
to apply this simple definition of the WHO glass definition of inpatient infection or community infection depends on knowing three things. Is the sample taken in the community or is the sample taken in the hospital? So that's what we call the location type. So if you know the location type, you know if it's a community sample or a hospital sample. I'm not saying community infection, I'm not saying hospital infection, I'm describing the sample. If it was taken in the community, we're calling it a community sample, and we will also call it a community infection for WHO reporting. That's simple to do. It's not always correct, but it's simple to do. And that's the WHO recommendation. On the other hand, if it is a hospital sample, then we need to know the date of admission and the specimen date. Using the date of admission and the specimen date, HUNET can calculate the hospital day number. And HUNET says, well, if the sample is from hospital day one or hospital day two, we're going to call it a community infection. And if the patient uh, has the sample in hospitals three, four, or later, we're going to call it a hospital infection. So this is a simple element of epidemiology that I would recommend you in introduce in the future. Um, you know, as I said, a lot of people say, well, if it's a hospital sample, it must be a hospital infection. But in my own database, for depending on the organism, depending on the specimen type, a lot of times, like 60, 70 percent of the hospital samples are taken on hospital day one and two. In other words, these are community infections, severe community infections requiring hospitalization. So I've given you a lot of comments, but I just want to simplify it to this with regards to hospital infections and community infections. I do recommend that in your database, you try to capture systematically in the future, now when possible, try to capture the location type. Is it inpatient or outpatient? and try to capture where possible date of admission and specimen date. Well, specimen date's not a problem. Everybody keeps track of that. But date of admission, for many hospitals, is very easy. For many hospitals, it's difficult because they don't put the doctors don't put the date of admission on the report sheet now. So what a lot of places do is they tell WHO, we, cannot, we do not know the date of admission this year in most of the hospitals. Next year, we're going to try to introduce this. So I would recommend that over time, you try to include on the request forms, you try to include in your data management systems the date of admission. This will allow you a useful way to do a quick, simple separation of hospital infections and community infections. It's not perfect, but it is standardized and it is easy to apply if you have the location type and the date of admission and the specimen date. I'll leave it at that. Any other questions on that point? or? Other other similar points. What about patient label data? Can you also reflect on that? Just some minutes. Patient label data. Sure. That's another element of when I first started. I started this project 1989, so 31 years ago. And at the beginning, a lot of WHO epidemiologists, I was telling them what I was doing. We're, I'm saying we're collecting routine data. And they say, you can't do that. The data are so biased and there are all these quality issues and you're not getting all the detail. And, but, and they had elements of truth, but what they wanted was not realistic. On the one hand, it's good now that people have switched. They say, oh yes, let's do that. Let's use the routine data. But then sometimes people also forget the limitations of it, the biases. The way I view this is there are two kinds of data needs. One is what you want is routine, comprehensive data collection as close to real time as you can. All organisms, all specimens, all antibiotics. Um, if you believe the microbiology data quality, then you can use these analyses for epidemiology and statistics and outbreak detection. If you don't believe the microbiology data quality, I still want to collect the data. I think it is a good thing to collect bad quality data, but don't publish it. Use the bad quality data to, imp to identify the, the problems in data quality and to improve them. For example, if I get data from 20 laboratories and two of the laboratories have very strange results, staph resistant to vancomycin, a lot of Klebsiella sensitive to ampicillin. I say, I don't believe the data from your laboratory. I'm not going to tell them, don't send me your data because that doesn't help anybody. That means they don't know their problems. We're sort of hiding the problems. I say, please continue to send me your data. 
I'm not going to include your data in the national report. I'm not going to use your data for treatment guidelines. I'm not going to use your data for looking at epidemiology, but I am going to use your data to help you to improve your data quality. So good data, bad data, biased data, unbiased data, all of these have a value, and you need to understand the value in order to appropriately utilize it. One of the purposes of the data is to improve the data system. More complete data entry, more accurate data entry, better microbiology, better testing, uh, normal results, not strange results. So this is data collection to improve data quality. Um, good. Um, I just got an email that I read quickly. Um, so bad quality data is still collected, but do not share it with anybody except for that hospital and just in the network coordinators. The good quality microbiology data still has problems of biases and sampling. Um, let's see, where was I going with that? Okay, so patient level data. The, so one kind of surveillance that I recommend is just collect the routine data. If you can use it for epidemiology and treatment guidelines and other things, if you can't use it for data collection, you use it for data quality improvement and feedback. Use the data, the patient data that are routinely available. Uh, there are certain basic things about patients that everybody should get or should try to get. A reliable patient identifier, that is a challenge if you don't have reliable patient identification numbers, patient gender and patient age. As I said, in patient outpatient, that's not really a characteristic of the patient, but it is a characteristic of the patient's medical visit, the patient's medical interaction. So at a minimum for routine surveillance, I would suggest a patient identifier, perhaps the age if you're going to do, I'm sorry, perhaps the patient's name if you're doing the clinical reporting, age and gender, and date of birth if you have it. One advantage of date of birth is it can tell you the age. Another advantage of date of birth is you can use it to find out if these two people with the same name, in fact, are the same person. So this is the minimum I would require for routine data collection for patient level data. But as I said, a lot of the epidemiologists were very critical and said, but we want to know what were the patient's risk factors? What were their travel history? You know, depending if it's an enteric pathogen, did the patient in the hospital, did the patient have a catheter? Did the patient have surgery? Did, um, did the patient require antibiotic therapy? What antibiotics did they get? Uh, did the, what was the patient's outcome? Were they discharged in five days? Did the patient die? Was the patient transferred to another hospital? All of this is extremely valuable information. And I, 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 in my mind, I distinguish between what I call public health surveillance and public health research. A lot of these things I just mentioned, clinical outcome, diagnosis, therapy, risk factors, medical interventions are extremely valuable, but most normal data information systems cannot easily generate these data in real time. They're in different databases or they're on paper. So I would recommend for routine data surveillance, come up with a minimal set like age and gender, maybe date of birth, because it's realistic and it has value, epidemiological value, male versus female, young versus old. You know, what are the pediatric pathogens? What are the elderly pathogens? If you want to go beyond that to the risk factors and the out, you know, the all those things that I mentioned, that's valuable, but it's often not realistic to do this routinely, forever, in all of your hospitals. There's an excellent hospital in Thailand that does exactly this kind of work. So it's what I consider a sentinel site. The sentinels, some sentinel sites just do like a sort of a research protocol one month a year or for six months, or they'll do it for blood cultures or, and sepsis, so, so when you start doing these protocols, you often be more specific. You often say, well, I'm only interested in the blood cultures for this study. There is a very good group in Thailand at one of the hospitals, they have a web application. And every day the infection control nurses go around the hospital and with the, with the smartphone application, they put in the risk factors. Did the patient come from home? Did the patient come from a nursing home? Did the patient come, was the patient transferred from another hospital? They put the therapy, uh decisions they put the patient outcome death discharge transfer so it's extremely valuable and they feel this is important enough that they do it all the time but it's just a lot of time and effort and training uh that's not realistic for a lot of other places 
so one recommendation I've made for a lot of people for a long time is I recommend focusing on routine, basic, comprehensive surveillance because of its value for, for laboratory quality improvement, data management, expertise, um, outbreak detection. Even if your data are extremely biased, if there's an outbreak, you will still see that in the biased data. If normally you have three pseudomonas in a hospital in a month, and this month they have 20 pseudomonas, even if there's a big bias, something has happened. So this approach is minimal resources. It's using the routine. It's comprehensive and a new pathogen if you have Serrati rubidiae. It's not an organism on most people's surveillance lists, uh, priority lists, it's not a priority pathogen, but if a hospital normally has zero and now they have 10, that's still important. That's still something epidemiologically has changed. In fact, there's a group I'm working now um, in Asia Pacific that's again coming up with a protocol that says, well, we only want blood, we only want this, we only want that. I said, that might be fine at the global level for Geneva, but as a national surveillance program, you really do want all the pathogens, all the specimen types, all the locations for outbreak detection and awareness of new threats. Um, so I recommend using the routine data. There's certain important things where you can improve the routine data. I would start with the simplest things, age, gender, and slowly over time date of admission. So use the routine data and for simple things, try to include those in all hospitals in a routine way. And then on certain priority issues, certain priority decision needs, you're making a national treatment guidelines, guidance, for example, for blood cultures, and you want to do a special study. The special study often does need extra resources, and you might want to do the special study for three months in a few of the hospitals, and then maybe repeat the study a few years later. Uh, I think I'll just leave it at that, but I, I hope those comments were useful. There's routine surveillance where you Sometimes what people want is not realistic, WHO included. They said, well, we want to know the patient outcome because they want to know mortality. They said, yeah, I know you want to know that, but the laboratory doesn't know that. They have a sample today and the patient dies three weeks later. The laboratory is not going to know that. It's valuable information, but it's sort of a different paradigm for what kind of surveillance do you want to do, what is sustainable and acceptable for existing resources. If you have extra resources, great, do as much as you want, but you, you can't do that for everything. You have to choose some priorities. Did I answer the question enough or do you ha have a follow-up question on that? Uh, thank you, John, just I am satisfied. Okay, thank you. Just I mentioned this because some of the clinicians uh, already uh, asked us this kind of question. Whenever we present the annual uh, surveillance report, most physicians from the uh, facilities they ask us where is the patient uh, I mean um, level data we don't have patient level data or you have to improve this and this you know this kind of comment is always given us uh, from the clinical side yes well That's so when, whenever I, people ask me a question like that because well, you know I I want to say that both are needed I want to say what my I, I do recommend strengthening the routine because it is sustainable and doable has great value but it does have its limitations. It cannot answer every question. Um, one additional advantage that I mentioned of this comprehensive approach is if you have a comprehensive approach with 20 hospitals, you are making a network of 20 hospitals with a long-term co commitment to collaborate over the next five, 10, 20 years. Now that you have a platform for collaboration, that platform is suitable for doing special studies. The special study might be for the hospitals and it might be for six months. Uh, the problem with a lot of these special, wonderful research projects is these things start and end. You do a wonderful project for six months and then the project ends. And then three years later, you do a different project. The problem with that approach is you end up starting from the beginning. The people have changed, the data quality has changed, all that stuff has to be redone. Uh, or if you, if you don't have a good routine base, you just can't come and do a special research project because there's a lot of basic capacity building that has to be done. So, uh, so one problem that I'm recommending the routine approach as the core of an ongoing national surveillance strategy, but some people do that and then they stop there. They never do anything to try to address the limitations. One of the things they do in Argentina is they have the routine surveillance that involves about 90 hospitals, um, but they also have a special project on respiratory pathogens there's a Latin American project called CIREVA, 
Sireva for Sistema is para respiratoria. It's for respiratory infections where they do serotyping. And serotyping is extremely valuable for pneumococcus to know if you have the right vaccine. So this is an example where they have the ongoing surveillance with 90 hospitals. They don't have all 90 hospitals do serotyping. There's a subset of the hospitals that are given extra funds and training to do serotyping following more of a protocol. And for these people, they also have some follow-up questions. If a patient is positive pneumococcus, was the patient vaccinated? What was, and so, so they have a national platform inside of which they do some of these special projects. So when the physicians ask you that kind of question, you need to be ready to answer the question because sometimes they say, well, I, I don't trust what you're doing. You're not giving us what we need. Um, and my first thought is, can you, can you please tell me in more detail what you want? Because sometimes what they want is valuable, but it's not realistic comprehensively. They say, well, I, I see what you're saying, but we don't have the research. That information is not available or it could be available. Let's collaborate and let's do a study on that. And then we'll publish the study. Let's try to apply for a grant. Let's try to get money to do that study. We will publish it. Uh, well, for me, one of the most <laughs> annoying, one of the most uh, unhelpful comments is when people say, well, where's the epidemiology? You say, well, what do you mean? Can you please be more specific? <laughs> when people say, well, we need more quote unquote clinical data. When some people say they want more clinical data, all they want is the patient's demographics, age and gender. Um, some people, they want to know the risk factors and the treatments and the outlines and the outcomes. So when people say, I want more epidemiology data, is their, their comment is so vague. I say, well, can you please be more specific? Some things that you might want, we have. Some things that you want, we don't have, but they are realistic. Let's try to put them in. Sometimes what they want is the patient outcome. For example, in Ireland, they have one of the questions they do is 30-day mortality for positive blood cultures for hospital infections, or, you know, for hospitalized patients. So what they will do is they will find, they will as, do as much as they can looking at the hospital's electronic records. In fact, the reality is I don't know exactly how they do it. I just know they do it somehow. I can't tell you the details of how they do this. But basically, like in my hospital, if I want to, I easily have access to um, the, the, the positive blood cultures. If I go to my hospital's computer system, I can look up these patients and see whether they're still alive, at least according to the hospital records. You know, if the patient went someplace else and died elsewhere, that might not be in my hospital system immediately. So, um, so something like mortality, it, it's not as if it's not realistic, but it's not easy to do. I would have to look them up manually because I don't have a database on mortality. Uh, we're working with uh, a, a United States, Nebraska, and they have a very nice system. They have a comprehensive system for national collection of the microbiology results on the one side. On the other side, of course, they have the statewide death registries. So we just need to link those two databases together. What patients had a blood, positive blood culture and which of those patients died within 30 days after the positive blood culture. So the next time somebody tells you about, well, where's the epidemiology and they're critiquing, you need to ask them, can you please be a bit more specific? Some of what you want, we have. Some of what you want, we don't have it now, but yes, we could try to do that. You can say sometimes what they want, it, I can see the value in it, but it's something really that needs extra time and money and resources and maybe best suited by a research project. For example, uh, as we're trying to, you know, with the Fleming Fund and WHO and other projects, we don't, we, we want every country in Africa to have a strong national surveillance program. If WHO is funding a special project on sepsis, we don't need every country in Africa to be part of that project. We could take a few from West Africa, East Africa. So the idea here is to take a, to have every country should have a good, strong national ongoing program that serves many objectives. When there's a certain need, pick some of the countries, some of the facilities and do a special project. I hope that is helpful. Uh, John, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When they critique it, sometimes their critiques, I, I said they're valid critiques, but what you want is not realistic with the money that we have available. So the way I view this is they say, well, that's not valid. Say, it is valuable. It's not what you need. What you need, we need more money. But what, what, what we have tells us about data quality. It tells us about trends. It tells us about outbreaks. All of those are valuable things. 
We're doing those laboratory testing. What can we use those data for? Maximize that. What can we not use the data for? Well, that's when you need to think about these special interventions and sentinel sites and protocols. Other questions? Once you have no more questions, I'm going to go to the to the outline that you see here. But uh, other questions? Okay, there are no obvious questions. Obviously, if you think of one, just interrupt me. So I'm going to start here with this number one. Um, also, oh, I'll start here. Tomorrow is when tomorrow is our last remote session. Well, that's regarding uh, you know Mikel and Fern. I, I don't plan to do this kind of training with you every week, every other week, but I'm still available. Uh, I am a WQ Collaborating Center to do this kind of work. So feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm happy to do more sessions, but I, I am busy. I can't do them every week, every other week. Uh, we will try to put more and more videos on the web, short things. I'm thinking of like three to 10 minute videos so that you can learn in other ways. Um, especially the data managers. The data managers should feel free to reach out to me by any time by email. If we can't address these issues by email, we can set up one of these sessions for an hour, an hour and a half. Um, so I'm not disappearing. I've been doing this for 31 years. I hope to do at least 31 more years, if not more. I work with Tom O'Brien, who is now 91, and he is still very active in our work. So I'm still around. Uh, so just write to me by email, and then if needed, we can set up another kind of training session with a small group or a larger group. Um, okay, so that's the first point. Second point, a review of antibiograms. Um, okay, antibiograms. Okay, let's see. Let me go to uh, do a Google search. Antibiograms, in other words, cumulative antibiotic statistics that hospitals or countries typically do on an annual basis. I'll show you a couple of resources. I'm going to look for... so. I hope all of you are familiar with CLSI M100. If you're not familiar with this document, this is, and there's just a free version of the document. The M100 is the document on how to do, how to interpret antibiotic measurements, zone diameters, MIC values. This document is updated every year. It's the breakpoint tables for diffusion and MIC. M100 is the tables for routine bacteriology. The M60, is the routine tables for fungi for yeast. M61 is for mold, but M60 is for yeast. Those two documents are available for, to read. You cannot download them, you cannot print them, but you can read them. So routine bacteriology, routine yeast, you can read online. Skipping down to VET08, VET08, the veterinary breakpoints. These documents are free, the M100, the M60, and the VET08 for you to read online. There are other documents, M61 for, uh, for mold, M62 for nocardia and actinomycetes, another one for tuberculosis. Uh, M45 is an important one, CLSI M45 is for infrequently isolated or fastidious bacteria. Most of them you've probably never heard of, or you may not have ever isolated them. Uh, a lot of them have to do with bioterrorism, you know, anthrax, um, uh, so, um, not, some of the pastorella, I forget the other ones. So this is, a, it's not, it's not routine bacteriology. It, I think it does include Campylobacter, which is important, but it is a fastidious organism. Um, so the M45 is not a free document. Um, uh, and it's also another one on the veterinary side, the veterinary side, uh, the VET08. The VET08 I showed you, that's routine bacteriology. The VET06 is along the same lines. It's, it's infrequent or rare fastidious veterinary pathogens. There's also the CLSI VET03, VET03, VET04. VET03, VET04 is about aquatic animals, uh, fish, uh, shellfish, shrimp, lobster, <laughs> mostly fish, salmon, things like that. So these are not free documents, but most people don't need these documents. This is very specialized documents. So these are CLSI documents about how to interpret antibiotic testing and perform antibiotic testing. There's a different document called the CLSI M39. I'm one of the, I'm one of the lead authors of this document. This document is analysis and presentation of cumulative antimicrobial susceptibility test data. As you can see, the price ranges between $54 if you are a member, $153 or not. 
it only actually would cost about $80 to become a member. Um, so a lot of times, if you want to buy a bunch of documents, pay the $80, and then the rest of the documents usually go to for like half price. Also, I'm talking about for high resource countries in a low resource country, I would hope that you can get discounts or somebody to sponsor to purchase some of these key documents. Um, the, the M100 is updated annually. Most of these other documents, like the veterinary documents, are updated infrequently. The M39, we update it about every five or six years. This is the fourth edition. We're now getting ready to almost finalize the fifth edition. So I wouldn't recommend buying this document because hopefully next year we'll have the fifth edition. And if I view the sample pages, um, one the key person who, was, who really was the parent of, who did all this <clears throat> was Janet Henler. Wonderful personal friend. I went to her wedding. Um, she, I first met her. I think at, I think I first met her at uh, at Kemri in uh, in uh, in Nairobi, giving a training course, and she was showing people how to bleed sheep. And uh, so she's one of the US lead microbiologists, and she's the lead of this. And I'm the last one because I'm the guy who actually did all the statistics to support the recommendations here. Um, so this document, analysis and presentation. So this guidance is official CS, CD, uh, CLSI guidance on how to do. Let me see. If, here's the table of contents. How do you design information system, data analysis, data verification? A lot of what I've been telling you for the last many, many weeks is covered here somehow. Calculations, bias, limitations, section number nine, culturing practices, small numbers, comparing results, and then confidence intervals. So this is official guidance on CLSI on how to do facility antibiograms. In the fifth edition, we are now finally getting to network by antibiograms, including national antibiograms. So, so the initial focus of this was for specific hospitals to make local treatment recommendations. In this fifth version, we're moving a bit more towards a surveillance objective. So the focus is still on treatment guidelines, but we try to do, introduce elements that are not only treatment guidelines, but general surveillance and benchmarking comparisons. So that's what we're trying to put into the fifth version and then build on that eventually in the sixth version. Okay, that's the M39 document. There's another one that I'm also a co-author on. Uh, they keep on changing the number. Uh, see, let's say VET05. Yeah, VET05. Um, generation presentation, uh, application of <coughs> susceptibility test. Yeah, 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 veterinary antibiotic surveillance program. <coughs> this document, it has it the letter R. The R means it's a report. It's a one-time thing. Uh, a lot of things start as report the first time, and then later they get made into guidelines. So this is not a guideline. This is a report. Some of these reports are a simple report published once. Some of the reports eventually are transformed into guidelines that are updated periodically. Um, so that's that on veterinary documents. There's also an FAO document. FAO document on, um, well, I don't want to get too detoured on this. Uh, the FAO does also has recommendations not for data analysis, but for surveillance in veterinary pathogens. I, and I've discussed some of that on a previous call. Okay, so that's the CLSM 39. If I go to PubMed, and if I look for Stelling and Hindler, we have two publications together. The first one is about definitions for multi-drug resistant MDR, XDR, PDR. This is an important document commonly referenced by many people when they're looking for definitions of MDR, XDR, and PDR. It's a 2012 document. It really needs to be updated now. Hopefully that will happen eventually. It was coordinated by Dominique Monet at the ECDC in Stockholm. So Janet was on that committee. Uh, but Janet and I together, just the two of us, we did this publication in 2007 where we, because the M39 is a commercial document, we made a, a, a basically a free version of it as, a, as, a, as an article. To, and it also accompanied the, the M39. Um, so we want to redo something like this with more, with more authors on it. So these are some resources from some guidance on how to do antibiograms. Okay. Some other resources. I'm going to go to do another Google search. Uh, and I'm going to search for Philippines and antimicrobial resistance, RITM, the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine. I do encourage you. And I don't know examples in Africa. If you know any good examples around Africa for antibiograms, uh, it's not that I, it's not that I, there are none. It's just that I, I have not worked much in Africa until the Fleming Fund came along. Um, 
So if you know good examples from Africa, I would love to know about those. Uh, so let's see, this is, uh, this is RITM. They have the antimicrobial resistance surveillance reference lab. It'd be good to, for you to look at these to see the scope of their activities, their training courses, their quality assurance strategy. What I would like to show you, if I can find it, are their reports. Is, um, well, I think they have a more recent one. This is ARSP is the National Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Program. Oh, to find out more about ARSP, let me just go to the ARSP website. Let me go to that link instead. That's going a bit slow. So while that's coming up, I'm going to go to Thailand. Thailand, and I'm going to look for NARST. Well, I know what NARST is. Let me see if I can find it. No, I, I, well, I'll just go ahead. Thailand, NARST. NARST is the National Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance uh, Thailand, a center of Thailand. So here you can see their reports. Uh, <laughs> here's a funny way to spell HUNET. I don't know. I think they've made a mistake there. So everything that they have there is based on HUNET. Do they have an option for changing this to English? Well, okay, here's antibiograms. So let me look at their all antibiograms for 2019. So this is a simple drug bug combination with colors. So this is not a report, it's a simple antibiogram. Uh, some of the things, like here you see Staph aureus, and they have separated into MRSA, MSSA, ICU, inpatient, outpatient. So this, these are simple epidemiology things that you can do. So when they say epidemiology, that's too vague. Epidemiology has so many components. So some elements of epidemiology we can put in easily. Um, and green means it's a good drug, yellow means it's a medium drug, red is a bad drug. I think gray, I think gray means intrinsic resistance, you know, meaning it would never work. Um, uh, there's some other, there, and there are a lot in Europe. That, I'm gonna show you the one from the United States, uh, NARMS FDA database. This is the, it's a collaboration between the US CDC the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Food and Agri and the, and the FDA, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, um, for human fat, food and animal isolates. <clears throat> Where are we? Where's their database? Database, data, data. Resistance genes. So there's not a lot of new sources here. Resistance genes about NARMS. Meaning, re let me check resources. So they have a nice, so I recommend that you just look at what other people have done. So I did that with Vietnam. They were making the first annual report and I gave them some of these examples and they copied a lot of the ideas out of the Philippines. Um, NARS methodology, interpretive criteria, uh, somewhere in here. So I don't, I'm not going to look for it now, but they have an interactive database with graphs and charts. On the animal side, you can choose chicken, cattle. So they've done a nice job with that. So I'm now going to show you what we've done in Vietnam. Uh, and a lot of this was done with CDC import input if i go to here and i go to countries and countries and i go to vietnam and i go to where am i going annual report and let me just choose which is the most uh, september okay this is their they're getting close to distribution i won't give this oh i'm sorry this is a this is a, a an existing publication it's a 2019 publication which is nice so the vinaris is you know vietnam and micro resistance and um, and you can see Hunet is mentioned in their methodology for how they collected their data collection, but that's not what I meant to show you. Um, okay, this is the draft report from September 9th, and they are really in the hopefully next few weeks they are going to finalize it and eventually make it available. So I'm going to go over this quickly because you're not supposed to look at their data, and obviously you're not going to read this so quickly. But you can see here data collection. They describe what they've done, key results pathogen distribution, organisms of interest. It's a little hard to read. Let me make this a little bit bigger, enable editing. So, uh, let me go back to the top. So I'm just gonna focus on the table of contents. Overview of the Vietnam program. What are their objectives? What are their audience? What is their process for data collection, validation, cleaning, evaluation of results, limitations, very important to include that. Key results, data submission, how many facilities, there are how many beds, uh, the, the patient days I mentioned, summary of how much data was contributed, and then a special thing, subset about things relevant for glass, plus is a small subset of what they do. The organism distribution is part two. The antibiotic characteristics of priority pathogens is part three, different for each one, Pepsiella, Zinibacter, next steps. So that's that, I'm just gonna go quickly down to the bottom just to show you some of the graphs. 
So they've shown their country and the maps. They've described what kind of hospital each one is, North, South, Central. Uh, that's the glass table. I'm trying to find their, uh, where's their, huh? What do they use, HUNET or something else? Do they include the positives? Do they include the negatives? Well, do they include the positives? Yes. But do they include the negatives? Uh, data on isolates is being submitted. All of it, a subset of data. Do they have this? Data completeness comments. So it's not only about the epidemiology. And here you see average daily patient census, number of admissions, rate of samples per 1,000 admissions. And you see some of the numbers just don't make sense. They said 307, that doesn't make sense. That number's too high, this number's too small. This one is 4 million. So they're also finding you know, problems in their underlying quality that, that they will not include in the report in this first year, but allows them to make improvements. It's the data volume by facility. Um, if I pause, 10 most common pathogens seen in blood, staph forest distribution by inpatient, outpatient. I'm just kind of going, this is strep pneumonia with its antibiotic resistance. I'm gonna get out of this, but I really encourage you to look at some of the reports because um, these will give you good ideas and bad ideas about things you wanna do and things you don't wanna do. One of the things in Vietnam is the initial report was way too long. They were doing everything by blood and urine and it was just too many tables. No one's gonna read all of that. It's nice to have it on an interactive website. So if somebody wants to do it, they can generate themselves. But you know, you want a document that people can read. You also don't want to focus purely on the tables. The table, of course, is a core, but people don't read the tables. They read the executive summary, they read the highlights. So, um, and a lot of the highlights in the first year, the most interesting findings are often because of mistakes or biases and different kinds of errors. And that's part of the highlights of what we learned in this first year. In the first year, you talk about the limitations. As the years go on, you can more confidently talk about the, uh, the, the epidemiological findings. Um, so this is the Philippines page did come up. And here you see serotype on salmonella. So it's a combination of things that they've done. Uh, and this is actually a PDF file, so it's not interactive. But this is describing some of the work that they have accomplished. Okay, um, good. I know, so, so for instance, six documents. Uh, three of the documents are about antibiograms. I'm gonna start, first of all, with this Word document, the cumulative antibiogram. This is from the United Arab Emirates. One of our best beta testers or evaluators or recommend, persons recommending new features is Jens Thompson from Abu Dhabi. Well, he's from Germany, but he's been in Abu Dhabi for about 15 years. Uh, yeah, about 13 years. So here you see, it's just a nice example of what can be done. And I showed you another example for Thailand uh, where they put the colors in. He also does that for facility. So he's also done that for other examples. I didn't send that. So this is just nice, short and simple. <clears throat> this first one is gram negative bacteria. The second one is gram positive bacteria. And they separate Staph aureus by MSSA and MRSA and overall. And the third one, what is this one? This one is Canada. So this one's fungi. Uh, and this last one is tuberculosis. So that's one document that Fern sent. A second document is uh, two presentations. So the first one is this PowerPoint, and I think this one is from United Arab Emirates. Um, cumulative antibiograms, good things, bad things, basics, caveats, biases. What is it, this? So it's, it's, what is this? It's a 61 slides. So you see here, he's got the colors. So if you wanna go through this on your own, you might learn some useful things, or you might want to develop some of your own training materials. Um, why do you do these? Inform clinicians, guide, guide inform. So it's not one thing, there are multiple objectives for different audiences. That's a presentation he gives. Then Janet Hendler gave a presentation in 2019 um, in, in Mexico. So again, it's simplifying, you know, it's giving examples of precise liver patient, separating things by inpatient, outpatient, maybe age, maybe gender. You know, for example, in urine infections, it's very important to separate male and female. Females have a ton of routine, outpatient, normal, uncomplicated urine infections. Women also have complicated catheter and other associated urine infections. The men, it's a much different set. So the men and the women share the same risk factors for catheter infections. 
Uh, but the men, when they have a urine infection in the outpatient setting, it's often related to prostatitis. So, so for many things like blood, I wouldn't necessarily separate male and female. Uh, but for urine infections, it does make sense. Or for E. coli, because often 70, 80 percent of your E. coli are from the urine. So sometimes you want to bring in the epidemiology about the patients because it is relevant. Sometimes you don't. You know, male and female for wound infections, probably pretty similar. For hip infections, probably pretty similar. Uh, but it would differ for E. coli, especially for urine. It would differ by age group for the pediatrics, for the elderly. So these are simple epidemiology things that you can incorporate into your analyses. So these are some, these are some examples of what an antibiogram can look like and presentations on teaching about antibiograms. The other three documents are certain reports. I'm going to show, the, I'm going to show you the, the Vietnam one because the Vietnam one they took HUNET's standard report. I showed you HUNET is the standard reports. They copied the ideas of the standard reports and put them into their web-based platform. And then they put more things that I want to put back into HUNET. So what you see here in Vietnam is very close to what HUNET does. And what this does that HUNET doesn't do, we will do it. We are going to add some of these things. In fact, I have this version I'm showing you is from July. They have a newer version, but you don't need, I mean, it's close enough. So this is a sheet. This is an automatically generated Excel file. On this first sheet, it tells you about data completeness. 100% complete, 99% complete, age, gender, 0% complete in, in red. So you can tell this facility, can you please do a better job next year? That's sheet number one, data completeness. Sheet number two, you know, different things missing by patient that we would recommend. Um, you know, patient IDs, do you have unique IDs or not? Um, intrinsic resistance, uh, they did simplify this because I told them that it's good to simplify it. Uh, this is about intrinsic resistance. So this is a serotium arsescens resistant to ampicillin. That's normal. So, so they're showing you here routine resistance that's to be expected. Sometimes you'll see some of these in red. Like here you see this is in red. That's unexpected. Enterobacter is usually resistant to this organism, but this isolate is sensitive. So it's helping you to find unexpected results. HUNET gives you this. HUNET has these microbiology isolate alerts about unusual things. Basically, what I'm showing to you here is what I will call a data feedback report. It's not an epidemiology report. It's basically data completeness, strange, unusual, or important results. Next one, um, suggested antimicrobials. They're saying you should have tested this. We would have recommended uh, you know, we would have recommended this and this, but you only did this and this. It's what I referred to earlier as a core set of antibiotics. I recommend you pick a set, try to get everybody to do that set. If they want to do more than that set, that's fine. The sort of minimal set of value for clinical reporting and statistics. So this is about that. And that's the end of their data check feedback report from July. They have now taken my recommendations and incorporated them they haven't incorporated all of them into the to the Excel document. That's more programming. But they have updated it into their interactive web interface. So when you go to the web interface, this is very nice. The facility can see their own results. So for, we're not ready for a web interface yet in Ethiopia, but you are ready for HUNET standard report. I have shown you the HUNET standard report in the past. I go to HUNET 2020. I go to WHO test hospital. I go to data analysis, quick analysis. You see here four standard reports. The first one is the one that I made 20 years ago. Vietnam used that to inspire theirs. These other three ones, um, they each have their advantages and disadvantages. We're going to start integrating them. There are things I like about number one. There are things I like about the other. So we're going to start you know, taking the best of both the old and the new approach. What I like about the old approach is it's very concise. It's just the minimum high level in a way that you can put into a Word document. In fact, I can choose your Word, and it'll go to Word. Um, the other ones have more detail and more graphs, and you want both. Sometimes you only want the short version. Sometimes you want the long version. Um, good. So, so basically, I did this in a standard report. Vietnam copied it, extended it, and put into a web interface. We will be putting those back into HUNET. So I suggest that you periodically look at these standard reports because the next few months, there are a lot of improvements I want to do here to basically help people make a data check feedback report 
which is what I showed you from Vietnam, as well as annual reports of common things that many people would like to do. So I have just shown you the Excel document from Vietnam. So that's in your, so you've received that. I'm gonna show you this other one from Japan. John, could I interrupt? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, yes. yeah, you, mentioned, you mentioned, well, um, Vietnam was ready to do a web interface. Other countries are not, are not ready to do a web interface with their results. When yes. would you say a country is ready to do something like that? Well, they did it, so they, so uh, I don't know if it's used in Ethiopia. Uh, there's a very widely used public health reporting platform called DHIS2. Most of the Fleming Fund countries use DHIS2. Uh, I don't know about Ethiopia. Are you familiar with DHIS2 in Ethiopia? Uh, well, I don't hear anything, but it's so. Well, yes, they should be. Yes, they do use DHIS2. Maybe not the lab, but the MOA. Yeah, so DHIS2 is used in many countries for public health surveillance tuberculosis, HIV, uh, gonorrhea, influenza diabetes, cancer, doesn't have to be infectious diseases. Um, so a lot of countries use DHIS2 for data management, but not for antimicrobial resistance. Vietnam decided to explore DHIS2 expansion to include antibiotic resistance. The problem is DHIS2 really is not well set up for it. So they ended up doing a lot of custom Vietnam programming. And over the, so, they, so the Vietnam platform is three years old now. Over the years, they have moved more and more away from DHS2 features to their own customized features. So what they did in Vietnam is very, very nice, but it's not transferable. You know, it, it's not easily, you know, they'd have to, it, it, it took a lot of expertise to do what they wanted to do. Things like first isolate for patient, DHS2 was not ready for that. Doing antibiotic interpretations, they were not ready for that. Um, so uh, uh, let's see, Sri Lanka also has a web-based system for public health surveillance, it's not DHS2. And um, and they, he said, John, how can I, we're, we're very good at SQL, at SQL, we're very good at the web system. Can you help me with WhoNet and how can we integrate it? So basically they already had web-based systems and they incorporated, and they're incorporating or incorporated WhoNet into it. So basically I would, I would the, it's most practical if the expertise already exists to do this. Um, if the expertise exists to do this, it's easier because you're just adding another module to it. You can either load in aggregate statistics. This is basically what, you know, uh, what Glass does. You're not submitting isolated data to Glass. You are submitting your percent MRSA, number tested. So into these web platforms, uh, you can either submit your isolate level data and have the web platform analyze the data itself and that takes a lot of expertise. That's what Vietnam is doing. Or alternatively, you can submit to the web platform the aggregate statistics and display the aggregate statistics. And then what Geneva does with Glass. Well, of course, those data are not yet available to the public, but you know, eventually they will be. So uh, yeah, I would start is if they already have, and Bangladesh is a very nice web platform for everything, but not antibiotic. Oh, I'm sorry, they have DHS2 for most public health reporting. They have made a nice web platform for antimicrobial resistance. It involves manual data entry from nine pilot sites. This is also another good example to quote. They have nine, uh, nine pilot sites with three years of data. They're now in the process to expanding to about 40 hospitals. Um, those nine Sentinel sites, they collect a small volume of data. Uh, I don't know exactly what they do. I'm just gonna make it up approximately. They collect like the first 10 positive blood cultures per month, the first 10 positive urines, the first 10 positive sputums, the first 10 positive this, that, and the other. So it's a small subset of the data, but they do collect the patient risk factors and the, the outcome and the, uh, the, the diagnosis, the therapy. So it's kind of like a research protocol, but they do it routinely. So it's basically routine, ongoing specialized surveillance. It's a very valuable program, but it's a small data volume. Um, so, now, when they're going up to 40 hospitals, they're going to keep the nine Sentinel sites continue with a special protocol. But for the other 30 hospitals, they're just going to have them do normal HUNET, normal data entry, not do all of this additional work. Uh, and they're finding problems that people are not measuring zone diameters. They're not doing standardized testing. So there's a lot of capacity building. They started with the nine excellent laboratories in the country. So on the one hand, when you start a national surveillance program, you often start with the most excellent labs. The problem with the most excellent labs 
is you end up with the least representative results. <laughs> you end up with the ICU and the referred patients and the most resistance. Um, so it's this compromise. On the one hand, I want representative data, but more important than representative data is reliable microbiology. There's no sense in having representative data if you don't trust that the laboratory knows what they're doing. So what they did is they started with the nine excellent facilities, worked with them to improve them over the years. So those nine facilities are basically doing an ongoing special protocol, small data volume, a lot of patient details, but for their ongoing national program involving 40 laboratories, they're simplifying it to what is practical and routine. And one of their focuses is try to get them to move from recording R, I, and S to actual zone diameters. So this is part of a capacity building effort, uh, clinical reporting, quality issue. And you know, as the data support, they will use it more and more for epidemiology. By epidemiology, I wanted to, I want to describe this epidemiology, sort of know what's happening, the trends, the comparisons. There's a special element of epidemiology related to treatment guidelines. Treatment guidelines are often the worst application of resistance data. It's one of the most desired. You take you might you want the microbiology lab data and you want to apply it to treatment guidelines. The problem is the biases. If your data are not representative, you you are overstating resistance. You're saying you're telling the doctor that genomycin is 40% resistant, but in the general population, it might not be 40%, it might be 10%. So on the one hand, there's general epidemiology. What are the trends? Are there outbreaks? Is resistance worse here, or worse there? What are the most common pathogens? How is that changing? The general epidemiology. Then there's specific epidemiology related to treatment guidelines, and that's where you have to be extremely careful about these biases. Um, so, and, and the, you say these are reports about these accurately describe the data collected in our country. They do not accurately describe resistance epidemiology in the country because of the biases. So you say this is what we have. There's a lot of valuable valuable information in what we have. Use it for what we have but it, it is just not good enough for certain applications or, or it's good but you have to it's all those caveats we found 40 percent resistance but i think the true resistance is maybe like 10 percent okay um good so this is the this is the japan one so this program goes back 20 years and this is their monthly feedback report it's a partially an epidemiology report partially a feedback report and what you see here is not real data. It's what it's 10 isolates. It's, these are not real data. So just ignore the fact it's a real report for non real data. Um, good. Number of errors, number of warnings and alerts. So again, that data quality component. This is not meant to be shared outside of the stakeholders. This is meant between the national coordinators and the facility to give them a report which covers some elements of data quality, data completeness and some elements of epidemiology. So this month, and I like this, this month you submitted 10. Last month you didn't submit anything, two months ago. So it allows you to see a little bit of trends. Is it consistent from month to month? If the numbers change a lot, you kind of wonder if the data entry has changed. You know, like vacation. You know, Last month you did 100. Before that you did 100. This month you did five. Kind of suggests somebody went on vacation. That's part one. Here what you see is interesting. Let me just uh, zoom this in, zoom in on this. Okay, good. I'll just focus on some of these. So number of submitted uh, patients, 10 patients, 10 different patient identification numbers. It might be 12 samples from 10 people, okay? MRSA, zero. I mean, these are not real data. So just, uh, um, let's see. That's fine, okay. Um, let, me just, let me just leave my, close my inbox. See, I do get a lot of emails. <laughs> And um, unfortunately, I do have to answer most of them. Okay, so here what you see is very nice. It's what we call a box plot. And this is red is for your hospital. Within the context of the country, in the country, uh, let's focus on, uh, let's see, I'm gonna say zero cases. Well, okay. So in the country, this is 7.96 is the median value. Uh, the, the quartiles, are, or the 90% quartiles are like 1.15. No, I'm sorry, that's the range. The range is the lowest hospital is 1.15. The highest hospital was 38. The median was 7.96. Uh, 
And then these are the, you know, the 25 and the 90% quartiles. So you get to see not only where you are, you see where you are in the national picture. Are you higher than the average, lower than the average? Some things are to be expected. If you're the university hospital, usually you have more samples, more resistance, more MRSA, and that's normal. Uh, in pediatric hospitals, you usually have less. So you want to see, am I where I think I should be? So this is about some of the high priority pathogens. VRE, where are you? What is your number? And where are you in comparison to everybody else? So these are about important resistances. These are just about the species, Staph aureus, um, Fepsiella, et cetera. So, one is a, so just like I showed you in uh, Vietnam, they have one about the organisms and one about the resistance of those organisms. And then some graphs, monthly change. So these are not real data. So in January, they had zero. February, they had zero. But these are only January data, MRSA. So you can see that trending over time. Part of that is for data quality checking. Part of that is for epidemiology, for example, a possible outbreak. Uh, that was by resistance. This is by species, Staph aureus. This is major pathogen resistances by ward. You see the different wards here at the top. Uh, this one is for respiratory. This one is for urine. This is for feces. I find that these things go on way too long. This one's for blood. This is for cerebral spinal fluid. This is for other. And then this is a comment in Japanese on how to interpret the rest of this table. So that's a nice example of what they do. They've been doing this for 20 years. I'm going to go to the last example, which is what I would like to, what I want to do is take the content of the Vietnam and Hunet report, but it's put into the format of the Australia report. The Australia report has way too much text. Talk, 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 explaining what they're doing, da, 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 talk, talk, talk. Great, here's some data. This is actually the Hunet sample database. So I ran this on my Hunet data. 622 isolates, this is the WHO test data from January 1995. 622 isolates in January, it's the WHO normal data. Um, go down further and more, talk, 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 81 blood cultures. Staph aureus, 12 blood cultures from 11 people. And then you start to see, not everything, you see a subset of pathogens and resistances methicillin resistance, enterococcus. So I'm not that impressed by the content that they have here. It's very basic content. It's similar to content you've seen in the others, but I think they've done a very nice job of putting this into a stakeholder report. So it's great if you come up with the content that you want for Ethiopia, but I'm trying to package this in HUNET so that you could simply go to HUNET. I'm gonna say HUNET standard report, and let me go to, um, I'm in the wrong folder. Let me change folders. And a big joke test database, okay. So I'll just show you how far we've gotten. I'm gonna say export this to Word. Analysis one, analysis two, analysis three. Since we started uh, having our conversation since May, this part of Hunet is much faster. And we've made a lot of improvements over the summer, um, especially for some of these descriptive analyses. So the, now the slow part is actually just making the Word document. Okay, it's finished. Do you want to open the Word file now? Yes, I do. Word is now slowly opening. There it is. So here you see what you would see on the Hunet screen. Section A, file summary. Section B, percent completeness. Section C, so you're also seeing the concepts that you saw in Vietnam. Number of organisms by month, key antibiotic resistances. Uh, this one is microbiology alerts, section E, section F is, uh, what is section F, uh, low frequency results, doesn't matter, the configuration comments, etc. So I like the content, but I, I prefer the Australian formatting. So in the next several months, you're going to see an improvement in the content and an improvement in the formatting. So eventually, it would be nice if people all over the world did not have to create from scratch their own reports. What we would like is that we give them a nice unit standard report that they customize, they improve, they add their own text, we're trying to at least help you with the data preparation. So those are the three. So any questions? So I'm going back to the email, which I've already closed. Uh, so I've covered the first two agenda item points. The first was on the antibiograms. The second was on these template reports that we just looked at. 
And the third thing was basically leave it up to you. Still have more time. So before new topics, uh, are there any questions on what I just presented? If you are saying anything, you are uh, Yes? Uh, somebody started to say something. Uh, uh, what did you advise? Is it good to start with excellent facilities or many uh, weak facilities to start the surveillance data collection? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, let's see. It depends on a number of factors. Um, in part, your time. You know, so in terms of the annual report, for epidemiology, that you want to publish data, you want to submit data to GLASS, you want to start with the best facilities. Also, keep in mind that the best facilities themselves have trouble, either in terms of data completeness, like age and gender, antibiotic test practices. Um, and even if they're doing good quality testing in Hospital A, they may be doing different drugs than Hospital B. We're trying to get those to standardize. So I would have one special focus on the best facilities to make sure that they really are doing good quality, complete testing with good quality data management. I would also recommend, if your time and resources permit, to work with as many laboratories as you can manage in visits and in conversation and getting their commitments. If you don't trust their data, don't include their data. Okay, include their data. As you saw in the case of Vietnam, some of the things were purely descriptive. How many bloods did they submit? How many urines did they submit? Whether you're a good quality lab or bad quality lab, those numbers should be accurate. We did five blood cultures. Whether good blood cultures is another matter. So, so for those, uh, I'll, I'll refer to that concept as diagnostic stewardship. Are they taking samples? If you find a facility that does no blood cultures, there's some problem there. So you could include them in those kinds of tables that are not dependent on the laboratory quality. So, I'll say, so number number of bloods, number of urines, number of data submissions, completeness of data, uh, male, female, gender, inpatient, outpatient, specimen date, specimen type. So all facilities, irrespective of their data quality, these are meaningful things to measure and to share with the network people. Uh, if you believe that they are doing a relatively good job on organism identification, you can also present the statistics on that. They found 20 E. coli, they found 100 staff, they found so many staff in blood, so many staff in urine. And then the antibiotic results. Um, if you don't believe their antibiotic results, don't include them in those tables. So the answer to your question is, there, if the, in the ideal world, we would have every laboratory in every country participating in their national program. But it depends on their desire and their willingness. It depends on your ability to effectively communicate with them. In Argentina, there are about 130 laboratories that use HUNET. 96 of them have been invited to the national network. The other facilities have not been invited for a number of reasons, but the most common reason is the National Center said, we don't have the money and the time to support them because it's not only about data collection, it's about our ability to visit them, involve them in the EQA program. Or, um, uh, or sometimes data ownership. Sometimes a, a private laboratory does not want to share their data. Um, uh, so, so, so it's an example where there are a lot of places that use HUNET, and they are included in training activities. So they're not in the national surveillance program because to be in the national surveillance program, you have to have acceptable performance in the national EQA program. And if you are not included, your data are excluded for that quarter and they give you feedback and then they monitor your improvement over time. So in theory, you want all the labs, veterinary, environmental, human, animal, in the national program. Of course, it's not realistic in terms of your time availability. So think about what is available, what, what can you accomplish with your time? And I would basically sort of, as I said, I, I was sort of categorizing them to three types. All of all laboratories that from which you collect data, you can report on their data volume. How many bloods, how many urines? Whether it's a good lab or a bad lab, you can still, they can still say, as long as their data entry is complete, you can see still, still see how much testing they did, which allows you to see how many blood cultures 
per hospital bed, for example. The second one, if you believe they're organisms, if you believe they do a good job on organism identification, then you, you can include them in the organism summaries. And if you do not believe their antibiotic results, or if they do just bad combinations of antibiotics, you don't include them in the antibiotic tables. So I have not given you an answer. I, I always there's always the ideal, and there's always what real what is realistic. And if you want to, if your focus is to put out a published report with semi-reliable, you can keep in mind the excellent quality laboratories still have major problems of biases. It's not the laboratory's fault that people are not sending samples. People do not send samples because, for many reasons. The, the hospital doesn't have money to pay for it. The patient doesn't have money to pay for it. In many places, they don't send samples because it takes the lab two, three, four days to get results back. That's the nature of microbiology and cultures. It takes time. So my patient's in front of me. I need to make a decision now. They're in the emergency room. I'm going to send them home. They're not going to come back for the results. So I'm not going to send something to the lab because even if I get a result, the patient's gone. So that's one reason why people don't send samples because of those delays. They'll only take the sample if the patient's being hospitalized. It's going to be around for a few days. Some places do not send samples to the laboratory because they simply do not trust the laboratory. You know, uh, a lot of times physicians, they say, well, the laboratory has been reporting to me vancomycin resistant staph aureus. An uninformed clinician will believe that the laboratory knows what they're, what they're doing. The informed clinician says this laboratory does not know what they are doing and they, can, they might just stop sending samples. What you really need is a good communication to address that. So keep in mind that even excellent quality microbiology laboratories do not have representative data. Um, so, uh, so all data is valuable, but if I don't trust the data, I don't put that into a public report on a website. I just put things that I believe that I think are reasonable. And then on top of that, I still always put these biases, the caveats and the limitations. Uh, also, I view this as a work in progress. This year, let's just get things off the ground. Let's just start with the nine bacilli, let's, like in the case of um, Bangladesh. You know, um, let's just try to build a good system for data management so that we know what we're doing. Let's try to build some trust and confidence. Let, let's get some things out that are incentive for other people to join. They have seen some good results. And with good results, it also helps get it to track funding and money. Um, and this year, let's just try to go for nine. And then next year, let's try to do a few. So that's what they did in Argentina for many years. For several years, they tried to incorporate between five and 10 labs per year because that's what they felt was they needed to visit the laboratory, discuss them, train them. So they ended up taking a lot of the advantage of Latin America has not been, unfortunately, what they've accomplished in resistance containment because they're very good on the microbiology side. They're not very good on the antibiotic use side. But that doesn't mean nothing has been accomplished. What Latin America has accomplished is much better microbiology capacity. People often blame the microbiologist, but did you really make any difference in resistance? Did you prevent hospital infections? Did you make better treatment guidelines? Did patients get the right drugs? Did you decrease antibiotic use? You can't blame the microbiology surveillance network if those things didn't happen because you need the pharmacy involved. You need infection control involved. You need the government authorities involved. You know, the hospital pharmacy can control antibiotic use in the hospital, but it's only the government that controls antibiotic use in outpatient pharmacies. So we can't blame the microbiology lab for not doing this as part of their surveillance program, but you can blame the microbiology laboratory if they don't reach out to these other groups. They need to reach out to the clinical societies, the pediatric society, the surgical society, uh, the national hospital accreditation groups, um, because the microbiology data is only one element of a resistance containment strategy. You do not need any data from the laboratory to tell people to wash their hands. <laughs> you don't need any data from the laboratory to say, don't take antibiotics for viral infections. Um, so the laboratory data have great value, but it's only part of the solution for intervening and preventing infections and better using antibiotics. While you think of more questions, I'm going to go back to my email just to see some of those comments that Fern noted. And if I look for, um, 
I, if I want to search for the word fern, I can look for the word fern. If I say from fern, it makes, oh, uh, let me go back to my inbox. From fern. And if I go to the coupon, yeah, it's a, it's a nice little thing in Outlook. If It just helps you to narrow down your search. So uh, if I said fern, whoops. I get all these messages. If I say from Fern, you know, it just helps to simplify the, the search. So anyway, so I'm going to open up her email about today's agenda. Let me maximize this if I can. And let me go in this and zoom in a little bit. Okay. I was just doing that while you think of more questions. If you have no more questions, I'll take a look at this. But we have um, half an hour. What would you like to talk about next? John, John, if I might, I mean, I'm not, I would prefer to leave the floor to, to our colleagues in Ethiopia, but if there's silence, um, I'm going to ask you if you could not, in very simple terms, um, just explain again, th what, what is phenotyping? We followed your example, but please just in simple terms, describe phenotyping. Uh, sure. Um... And another, uh, uh, before I comment on that, just on these ideas of reports, keep in mind that the in the first one, two years of any surveillance program, the, the focus is really to try to build a strong program, describe the data collection, the quality measures, all of these things. Um, and in answer to the questions from your colleagues, where's the epidemiology? Where are the patient level details? To tell them, we're, we're doing this, we're just getting this off the ground. We're focusing on the completeness, data management, laboratory test quality. What you want sounds great. We're not there yet, but let's have this discussion as an ongoing conversation. Next year, let's try to do these things, the following year. Um, so that's just one strategy. Uh, you know, right now, you're, you're doing something important and novel. And in the first two years, the most common things you find is there are big problems in the data. And we need to focus on that. Once the data, once you, you can say, I do trust this, I don't trust this, then you really have the basis for, you know, the five, 10 year, 20 year program. Um, uh, also, I, I did ask on a previous call, I do forget, is Ethiopia a member of GLASS? I do recommend that you do that because it does open opportunities for training. If I say WHO GLASS resistance countries, GLASS, and if I go to uh, country participation, so I'm on the WHO website. So here you see a map. Well, the map is, let me, yeah, enlarge map, enlarge map. Good, so Ethiopia is enrolled. Uh, has Ethiopia submitted any data to GLASS? Because enrolling doesn't mean you have to submit data. A lot of countries say, I want to join GLASS. I'm not ready to submit data yet. But GLASS is not only about data. It's, do you have a network? Do you have a national strategy? Do you have a national plan? Who are the main contacts? for further communications? Do you have an EQA strategy? All of this is GLASS. And then on top of that, there is the official data element about resistance. It's, it is now has been renamed to GLASS AMR, I think. GLASS is incorporating a lot of new modules. GLASS for isolate level fungal, uh, fungemia, your candidate in blood. They have another one on consumption. They have another one on whole genome sequencing they will be incorporating the one health aspect of food and animals. So I'm glad that you are a member of GLASS, but it's good if you, but I don't know who knows about it. So the WHO is putting more and more resources and development into this that you can learn about from here. Also, if you look at the GLASS reports, what's interesting in the GLASS reports is they are not putting any resistance data into the GLASS report because they said there are just too many problems. We do not believe the data. So there's really a wonderful report. This is the most recent report. Um, uh, let me just take a look at Thailand, for example. Acknowledgements, Thailand, upper middle. So what they're categorizing here, they're giving an example there. Culture positive, et cetera. Oh, oh this is a special project called EGASP. EGASP is for gonorrhea, expanded gonorrhea surveillance, so that's a special project. Let me continue to look. Um, oh, that's more, ga okay, so here's the page on, um, I lost it again. <laughs> it doesn't matter which country I look at, let me just pick the next country on the list. 
Well, let me see if Uganda is here. Well, let, let, no, Ethiopia. It says glad. It says Ethiopia low income level. Ethiopia population 112 million. You are implementing antibiotic resistance. You are not yet implementing these new ones of antimicrobial consumption, HIV, TB, yes, malaria, yes. Price cycle is the environmental one for sewage, water samples. EGASP is for gonorrhea. You have nine surveillance sites. I hope this information is correct. Somebody from Ethiopia reported it. Seven hospitals, two outpatient facilities, nine labs perform, perform AST. The National Reference Lab, EQA is provided. Um, 2019 data call. There were four surveillance sites, two hospitals and two data. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, two hospitals, two outpatient facilities. <clears throat> so what you see is data were reported on the green pathogens. You reported acinetobacter age, gender, infection origin, partially, less than 70%. Because to do that, you need the date of admission. Data on the number of people, that would be the, uh, that would include the negatives. And that's it. So there's nothing in this report about the resistance data because Geneva knows the data are not good enough. The resistance data are not comparable or complete enough to make a data analysis report. Hopefully in a few years, they will change their mind. And hopefully in a few years, they'll start choosing a subset. These countries, we are ready to report the resistance data. Okay, um, those are things I had to say. And then, Fern. John, John, there was, so, sorry, there was a question in chat that I didn't see. So uh, let's look at that question. Uh, basically, it says, can we use regional antibiogram data for empirical treatment if the region has the same demographic population? Uh, as is always the case, the answer is, well, it depends. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, the answer is that all of these things are useful. It is useful to know what is happening in the world. What is the general trend of imipenem resistance or vancomycin resistance or ciprofloxacin resistance? So it's useful to know what's happening in the world. It is more relevant to know what's happening in Africa. It is even more relevant to happen what's in Eastern Africa. So if you saw some nice reports from Uganda or Kenya, you know, some surrounding countries, yes, that is useful. And yes, I would find that valuable in designing my national and local treatment guidance, but always with caveats. First of all, their data probably has biases. So the same things I was telling you about using your own data, how to interpret your data, they have the same problem. So just because they publish the data for Kenya does not mean that the data are not biased. They're probably also biased. So all the local biases exist in any foreign data that you may want to copy. Um, so you, that's why you really do want your own local data. But even think about it in the same city. So for example, I'm at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. We are connected by a bridge to the Children's Hospital. We are across the city from the Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, so the resistance patterns in all of these laboratories is interesting and irrelevant, especially for community pathogens covering the same population I would suspect resistance rates for community infection should be pretty similar. You know, if you if you go to you know um, if if you live in this part of Boston uh, with your medical insurance, maybe you'll go to Mass General Hospital, but maybe instead you'll go to Brigham and Women's. It's a, if it's a community infection, the resistance rates are probably pretty similar, irrespective of which hospital you go to. But I do want to qualify that we also have Boston City Hospital, and Boston City Hospital is more of a low-income population. Low income populations also often have higher levels of resistance, uh, surprisingly to many, but low income populations often have more antibiotic use, in part because they have, may have more infections, uh, more bronchitis, more smoking, as well as more inappropriate use of drugs. You know, um, uh, uh, so, so the data, so, so for outpatient infections, I would hope that the resistance rates would be similar, but that won't always be true if they don't serve the same patient, if the, if the different patients go to different hospitals. The information is still valuable, especially if they show the same resistance trends and if the trends are consistently changing over time. We, we found in our, in our area that penicillin resistance in Staphylococcus aureus is going down in my hospital. It's also going down at Mesh General Hospital. It's just a community thing where resistance really is coming down. It's very different when you consider hospital infections because that has a lot to do with the hospital's use of antibiotics 
and the hospital's hygiene issues. So you may have two identical hospitals across the street from each other, and one hospital has bad antibiotic use, they use a lot of imipenem, a lot of vancomycin, and they have bad hygiene. So a patient gets something, they have a lot of in-hospital outbreaks. The other hospital across the street might have the same patient demographics, but better hygiene, better infection control, and lower resistance rates. So to answer your question is the regional antibiograms are relevant. It is good to know what's happening. It's good to know it's a very bad issue for that hospital. If it's a very bad issue for that hospital, um, I keep on saying hospital, but of course I also include community. The data from that hospital laboratory includes community samples. So the, da the data from laboratory one is valuable to the people in laboratory two. A lot of the findings are probably similar. This exists in my country. For them, it's 10%. For me, it's 15%. So the numbers won't be the same, but it is relevant. But you can't say, you cannot make the conclusion that their data, it, it, it does not mean I don't need my own data. So in the short term, maybe I will use the data from the other facilities. And especially in a country like Ethiopia, many parts of the country do have no microbiology data. So the country, the, the communities with no microbiology data would benefit to know what resistance rates are like in Addis Ababa. The resistance rates in Ababa, Ababa are probably higher than in the rest of the country. And as long as you say, well, resistance in Addis is maybe 20%, maybe resistance out in a rural community is you know, 10%. So yes, all of these data are useful, you just have, you just, but you cannot say that my situation is different. You, you, if you have your own data, you compare your data with the other people's data and see what is the same and what is different. Are the patient populations the same? Is antibiotic use the same? Are the hygiene issues? Is the type of care provided? In Boston, we are a tertiary care hospital. We have other hospitals, they're community hospitals. So even though we draw from the same community, if the patient is has chemotherapy and sepsis, they'll come to my hospital. If they have pneumonia and sepsis, they'll probably just go to a, one of the community hospitals. So if you have no data of your own, definitely use the regional data from within your country, from surrounding countries. And just keep in mind that those data themselves are probably biased and those data are useful, but they're not necessarily representative. Uh, you raised also another interesting point. When you make treatment guidelines, part of what you want is to look at these treatment, uh, is to look, look at the resistance data. But you also need to keep in mind the biases. I've mentioned that many times. You wanna look at the costs. You know, imipenem is a better drug than ampicillin, of course. Well, ampicillin resistance rates are so high. Let me choose a better example. Imipenem is usually a much better drug than ceftriaxone. They're both good drugs, but imipenem is a better drug. But it's also more expensive is one problem. Um, but it's also a reserve agent. You want to save these reserve agents for the people who really need them. Um, so that's a, So when you're trying to make a treatment guideline, you're considering resistance rates. You're considering costs, you're considering reserve agents and the desire to preserve resistant reserve agents for the sickest people today, like the ICU patients, the emergency room patients with sepsis, and you want to preserve them for future generations. Uh, you want to distinguish between the complexity, a simple, a simple urine infection. You might want to go with genomycin. It works 80% of the time, it's probably fine. But if it's a complicated urine infection with a sepsis, you may want to use amikacin. So you also want to consider some of these patient considerations about severity of disease. If a patient is a non-complicated urine infection, they're not going to die typically in the next 24, 48 hours. So give them the cheaper drug that's usually effective. If the patient's not getting better, if the microbiology lab results come back, then switch to another agent. So for non-life-threatening infections, the immediate goal is not saving the patient's life. The immediate goal is just decreasing suffering, decreasing length of disease, and in a few cases, preventing eventual death. But if it's a non-complicated infection, they're not going to die immediately. You do have some time. On the other hand, with sepsis, meningitis, life and death is there, and that's where you want to go up to the next level. Um, what else about treatment guidelines? There's so many things that go into it. You know, For example, if you have a wound infection, Wound infections are usually, uh, skin, I'm talking about skin wound infections, are usually polymicrobial. For most wound infections, what you need is basic good hygiene, soap and water, surface, you know, disinfectants, 
bacitrace and neosporin and broad spectrum if you decide to give an a systemic antibiotic an oral antibiotic so give something broad spectrum like cefazolin you if you find um you know if you find or, or sputum sputum is multi polymicrobial so you, often you don't want to use the laboratory data to make decisions on um on, on wound infections, because usually you just want broad spectrum coverage and good hygiene. For something like pneumonia, the problem is you want a good quality sputum sample. Without a good quality sputum sample, you end up with what we call our spit samples or saliva samples, meaning you're not getting the infection. You put a swab in somebody's mouth, or you ask somebody to, you ask somebody to spit, to put sputum into a cup, and they go, a lot of times you don't get sputum. A lot of times you just get saliva from the mouth. That tells you nothing about the patient's pneumonia. And what you get is just basically a sample, a microbiology sample with a lot of oral flora. So treatment guidelines depend on a lot of things besides the resistance data. So yes, one of these considerations are the regional guidelines from other countries, the regional guidelines from within my country, but treatment guidelines are not determined solely by the resistance data. You need to keep these other things in mind. Also for something like simple watery diarrhea. Simple watery diarrhea is usually viral and doesn't need treatment. Simple watery diarrhea is very often salmonella and campylobacter. And that also usually doesn't need treatment. It use, oh, what it needs is oral rehydration therapy. It needs fluids, it needs food. It needs to replace the fluid that is being lost. And for simple uncomplicated watery diarrhea, antibiotics are not recommended. And that's the treatment recommendation, give oral rehydration therapy. For complicated diarrhea, like Shigella, dysentery, fever, that's when you want to use uh, antibiotics. So all of these different thoughts come into play when you're making treatment guidelines. WHO does have a recommendation, for example, in the case of uh, meningitis, gonorrhea, and malaria, I think, uh, what I'm saying is approximately correct. If resistance to the first, if you have the first, if the country's national first line agent is, you know, Fanzadar or chloroquine or isoniazid or whatever it is, you have your first line agent. If the first line, if the resistance to the first line agent exceeds 5%, then you should think about changing to a different first line agent. That's how we went from chloroquine to this, to that, to the other. If resistance exceeds 5%, that's, don't consider that as a good first-line agent in a life-threatening disease. In a non-life-threatening disease, like a simple urinary tract infection, 10% resistance, 20% resistance, 30% resistance, especially in a bias sample, is reasonable because the patient's not going to die immediately. You do have some time. In a life-threatening disease, like meningitis, falciparum malaria, gonorrhea, not life-threatening immediately to most people, um, uh, but, the, but um, we have what's called the in vivo in vitro correlation. Just because the laboratory says resistant does not mean the patient will get better, having to do with dosage and uh, severity of disease. You know, if a patient has, <coughs> I mean, let's say the patient, is, the patient is a sensitive sample and they get an appropriate antibiotic and the patient dies a half an hour later. If the patient dies a half an hour later. It doesn't matter if the bacteria was resistant or not. You know, it doesn't matter if the patient got an antibiotic or not. There simply was not enough time for the antibiotic to have any impact at all. So in this case, it doesn't matter if the bacteria is resistant or sensitive. If they got an antibiotic and they died 30 minutes later, the patient was or the disease state was too far advanced. There are other cases where the patient clearly has a resistant infection, but the patient gets better anyway. You give you know, the, the isolate is resistant to genomycin. You give the patient genomycin and the patient still gets better. Why? Because patients get better most of the time on their own anyway. If it's a non-life-threatening infection, eventually they'll clear their own infection even if it's resistant bacteria. It means the antibiotic is not helping or it's not helping a lot, but the patient's own immune system. So this is a case where the laboratory says resistant, but the patient got better. There are other cases where the patient, where the laboratory sense, says sensitive, but the patient doesn't get better. And that may have to do with severity of disease or maybe it's an abscess. 
So there are cases where the laboratory result and the clinical outcome don't agree with each other. That's what we call the in vivo person, in vitro laboratory correlation. They just don't match. But there's some things where you do have to pay attention. If the laboratory says gonorrhea resistant, that's important. If, the, if it says genomycin, if, if the laboratory says resistant to penicillin gonorrhea, penicillin will not work. This patient will not get better on their own. If the laboratory says ceftriaxone resistant gonorrhea, this patient will not get better on their own. So these are cases where patients do not clear on their own. You, what the laboratory says you have to believe them. If it says resistant, do not use the drug. The patient will not get better. The case of meningitis, the case of tuberculosis, the patient of gonorrhea, it's extremely important that the patient gets treated correctly the first time, because otherwise the patient may die for tuberculosis, well, for gonorrhea, I'm sorry, for TB and for meningitis, or the patient may not die, but they're gonna to continue to spread their infection to other people. Somebody with gonorrhea typically will not die, in women, it can cause pelvic inflammatory disease, it can cause death, but the most common thing in gonorrhea is often asymptomatic or it is symptomatic with continued transmission. So in both of these circumstances, you need to trust the laboratory. The laboratory says resistant, let's use a drug where the laboratory said sensitive. So this, is, this comes into play with regard to treatment guidelines. Um, when you have an excellent in vivo in vitro correlation where life and death or transmission is on the line, you need to go with the laboratory data. For something like urine infections, you, you wanna be informed by the laboratory data, but you also keep in mind, most people will eventually get over their urine infections, or you at least have some time to change their antibiotic after two, three days. This happens very often in the United States and elsewhere. A uh, woman goes to the doctor, the doctor gives the woman an antibiotic, does not take a sample, and the doctor says, if you're not better in two, three, if you're not getting better in two or three days, come by again, to, we'll take a sample, we'll change the antibiotics and we'll take a sample. So, um, so they're just being informed generally by overall statistics, but you're not worried about an immediate death. Um, so as I said, for meningitis, malaria, HIV, you want resistance to the first line agent to be under 5%, because you believe the lab and you need an effective therapy. However, that 5% is assuming you're talking about an unbiased sample. You know, so maybe the true level of resistance is 3% and this drug is working perfectly well. But if you have a biased sample of the treatment failures and the sickest people in the hospital, the laboratory may say it's 15% resistance. So just because the laboratory says 15% resistance, does not mean that you're really above 5%. So people say, well, when should I change my treatment recommendations at 5%, 10%, 15%? For life-threatening infections or for gonorrhea because of the transmission issue, people often go for 5%. If, if resistance exceeds 5% to your first-line agent, change your first-line agent. But that statement is only true if you have an unbiased sample. So sometimes what people will do, especially in the case of something like malaria, is malaria, they're not doing laboratory testing, they're looking for treatment failures. So if they, have, if they have 100 people with confirmed malaria and they give these 100 people first-line therapy, Fanzadar, artesamine or whatever, if they find out of the 100 people that 20 of them fail therapy. This does not change a change in the treatment recommendation immediately. They want the resistance to be under 5%, and if they if they want they want the treatment failure rate to be under five percent. If they find the failure rate is twenty percent, what you want to do is investigate why. And there are a number of reasons that patients fail therapy. One is because of resistance. There are several other reasons. Well, one is your data might be biased. You're, you know, most patients treat themselves for malaria at home. The only people who come to the clinic are the ones who already treated themselves and didn't get better. So you may have a bias in your 20%, it's not representative. Or they may not be taking their pills, maybe they didn't get pills. Or they got the pills, they got the prescription but they didn't get the pills or they only took two days of pills and then they stopped taking them. Or their pills that they buy are bad quality. You know, there was a very good uh, BBC documentary from Nigeria and India where they looked, they spent half an hour in the documentary, half an hour in Nigeria, and half an hour in India, what they found in, in Nigeria, they said a lot of our drugs are poor quality. 
the malaria drugs have half the potency, a tenth of the potency. There's no drug in it. That was the first half of the documentary. The second half, they went to India and they went into some of these pirate companies and the journalist had a secret camera. And they went into one of these pirate drug companies and the drug company, and the person said, I want to buy some pills. I want, I want a, a shipment of a thousand bottles of ibipenem. And the company asked two questions. How much antibiotic do you want us to put into the pill? Question number one. Question number two, how much antibiotic do you want us to put on the label? And those are two different questions. On the label, put 100. In the pill, put 10. So this is another reason why patients fail therapy. You know, so, it, so as I said, with malaria, if it's 20% treatment failure, I'm not going to change my treatment guideline immediately, but it does prompt the need for what they, they'll often do, like what's called a lot quality, quality assessment program. They want to evaluate were the drugs of good quality, were the patient representative, did they take their pills and were they compliant? So they're looking at all these factors. So if resistance in that example goes above 5%, they do a special, if treatment failures go above 5%, they do a study. And then the study may suggest that the problem is resistance, or the study may suggest that the problem is just poor quality and people are not getting their drugs and they're not taking their drugs. So this whole idea of treatment guidelines is it's complicated subject unto itself. And it's, it's unfortunately the most common thing people want to use resistance data for, but it's also the most problematic in terms of biases and the in vivo in vitro correlation. I do talk a lot. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Thanks a lot, John. This is great. I mean, we've tapped into your experience uh, far beyond uh, the WhoNet platform, so we, we, we appreciate that. Um, we're approaching the end of the uh, uh, two-hour session, so and since this is the last uh, session under our coordination, under Mikkel and Fern's coordination, um, we just want to make sure you are aware, Gabriel and everyone else, that we do have certificates. So if you would like to have a certificate, um, you know, we would just need your name and your institution. And you can, um, you know, simply re respond to Mikkel or myself and, and we'll send that to you. And secondly, um, since we do hope to continue working with John on a series of shorter targeted videos, uh, we will probably reach out to you in a very soon and just ask you, you know, if certain sessions were of particular re relevance or interest to you, we would like to know that for, uh, you know, to guide our, our future uh, work, uh, hopefully with John. And and now I'll turn it over to, uh, I guess, uh, Mikkel, and, and also we should see if there's any other questions from the participants. So over to you, Mikkel. Yeah, thank you very much, Vern. Um, so, so before we wrap up, um, does the Ethiopia team have any questions on on what Fern just said? No. Okay. No question. No, I have no. No, I have. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I hear you. Uh, I hear. Actually, uh, uh, this is a, actually we don't have time for the question, but uh, I have some um, reflections. One yes, uh, we will also uh, raise if we need any session, specific sessions. Once we go through all the sessions and uh, refer all the all the things, we will ask actually for another session for a specific uh, sessions that will be a good um, suggestion from Fern. And the second one is uh, if John, if you can really give us the major references links so that we can use those references uh, for future use instead of every time asking you. It will be also uh, good to give us uh, major resources. Okay, um, uh, Miguel, uh, I could do that. Do you, will, as part of the notes, will you, I don't remember what I talked about. <laughs> uh, if, yeah. you, if you note down some of them, <laughs> Uh, I just did a lot of Google searches. I could try to remember, but in the notes, if you maybe just put down which ones you would like to me to guide you towards, I'm happy to provide those. Yeah, we will do and, that. And, yes, and please, we do have detailed notes with the links that John mentioned. So please do access those notes. And Mikkel, you can send out the link to the notes and the recordings again. Yes, uh, so... One, I, I, one comment is, uh, of course, you are in the unique position that you're in the same city as Africa CDC. And Africa CDC, in collaboration with WHO, is working on strategies 
for surveillance, uh, standards, quality, and potentially in, uh, partially the, between uh, IDDS and um, Fleming Fund and other ASM and other activities in Africa, all of them are collaborating with Africa CDC, I believe, with the general idea to build a platform around the country. So I suggest if I, I don't do you do you have very close connections to the resistance group at Africa CDC? Yes, we have a, a close relationship, and also uh, they are supporting antimicrobial resistance surveillance uh, starting from this year. Great, because I think you can work collaborate together. They may have some ideas, and you can give them on site. You know, they don't need to set up a big meeting. They can just visit you, and you can get your give your input so that your experience can help to inform them and their ideas captured from around the continent. You could also pilot in Ethiopia. Uh, I did try to visit them in my last trip to Ethiopia, but they had some very large important meeting and they were unavailable, but definitely that will be a priority for me on the next visit. I do wanna take advantage of this time to thank you all for your patience. Remember how bad the sound quality was in that first video and your interest. I do wish you luck with all of your further activities and capacity building and surveillance. And it will be available, you know, not every week for two hours, but, you know, start by email with any questions you have. And as needed, you know, we can set up a session, you know, specific, for specific data analysis points that you would like to review. Well, we all thank you, John, for, for this session. So I think, uh, the, the the quality of the content is it's been always uh really good uh, i i personally have enjoyed them very much i hope everyone has enjoyed the sessions as much as i have um and yeah just a sincere thank you uh for for helping us for going along on 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 this right and to remind everyone that we have a youtube channel where all 14 sessions all 28 hours uh, have been uh, unedited. Uh, they're fully uh, just posted on the on the website. Um, we have the notes that we've been sending. Uh, I'm I'm trying to get all of the notes and all of the files that John has been sharing with us on one website. And maybe I'll put the link um, on one of the comments on the videos on the YouTube channel. IDDS is working on um, on an IDDS website where we want to kind of uh, consolidate all of our content but we're still waiting we still need some some uh, approvals for that but uh, yeah it's been it's been a really really interesting um and uh, i'm happy we had really good participation throughout all of the sessions and just don't forget to reach out to me or fern uh that's for the ethiopia team if you need anything um just reach out you have uh, our emails uh just let us know and thank you, everyone. Uh, Miguel, regarding the website, you have the videos there, which is wonderful. Will it be possible? Would would it be also be possible to put the those Word document notes or PDF document notes onto that same channel? For example, a lot of people, I think, in theory, would be interested in it. But two hours, fourteen sessions, a lot of people, I think, would be more interested in just downloading the notes. You might want to review the notes about things you do and do not want to share with the general public, but you may want to consider, in addition to these long two-hour videos, that personally, I, I would have the patience to sit through that more than once, maybe put the notes in that same channel. Or I'll well, yeah. to do that on YouTube, but the we, link, well, link, links to the, to the documents. Yeah, but we, you have to store them somewhere, and that's the issue. Um, if we put them on SharePoint, that's our, you know, IDDS SharePoint. It, 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 there is, there are some logistical issues, but I'm working through. Uh, we need a really what we do need is an IDDS website where we can host all of this content. But yeah, I'll, I'll try. I'll find the solution to put those notes, and I agree it will be really helpful. So. I'll yeah. work on that. Table of contents, and then it allows people to get a lot of the value without without spending two days nonstop. Uh, absolutely. No, the idea is to work more on the videos and even create chapters so that yep. people can go right to the to the areas that would that they're interested in. No, yeah, that that's something that uh, we're going to be working on. So yeah, oh, and wonderful. For example, on this call, I did a lot of times it wouldn't be helpful to other other people because of the interruptions, the questions. But a lot of what I said on this call, I think would be interest to a general audience. So you may want to start clipping it 
and to five, or you know, like uh, if I talk for this on in vivo, in vitro, you may just want to clip those out as something for future development. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you, IDDS team, and we are expecting, as uh, John uh, comment, those uh, you know down level uh, documents, uh, Word or PDF, whatever. Thank yeah. you. And I see all the thanks on the chat. So thank you for those chat messages. Thank you, John. Really, it was interesting. Thank you very much. Mm. Have a great day, everyone. Bye bye. Likewise, John. I thank you very much for your expertise in sharing that so freely. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you.